بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight's topic may seem at first glance to be totally new. In making museums relevant for our children, Dr. Sharon Schaefer will be discussing a different museum audience. However, in 1983, when the galleries of Darlat al Islamiyah opened at Kuwait National Museum, the Dar was interested in this audience and published a special guide for children viewing the Sabah collection. In the following seven years, until the museum was looted and burned, children regularly visited Darlat al Islamiyah galleries on trips organized by their schools. Even without museum premises, the Dar after liberation continued to, after liberation to continue its activities. This included several art workshops for children. We began the season with an exhibition that was actually curated by children from Kuwaiti schools. It is therefore with special pleasure that Dar al-Atar Islamiyah is delighted to receive a highly sought after expert in the field, early learning in museums. An international consultant in object-based learning, she worked in Kuwait in the early 2014 for three months as part of a UNDP project with Dar al-Atar Islamiyah and the National Council for Culture, Arts and Letters. A radically different approach to education, object-based learning uses objects, such as those in museums, to encourage learning across a wide spectrum of educational contacts. Dr. Schaefer is Emeritus Director of the Smithsonian's Early Enrichment Center and an adjunct professor at the University of Virginia. She is the author of Engaging Children in Museums, which was just published in January 2015. Children have always learned from objects. Today's children are heavily engaged in a variety of new objects, such as iPads, iPhones, and other mobile devices. Tonight, we encourage you to turn off your objects and welcome Sharon, Dr. Sharon Schaefer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that generous and kind greeting. Um, it is with incredible um, pleasure and um, honor that I'm here with you tonight, um, returning to a place where I feel as though I really have friends, not only in the people, my colleagues that I met last year, but also in the artifacts and the institution itself. It's a wonderful place, as you all well know. Uh, tonight, I am going to share with you some of my experience over the past 25 years and my passion for education for young children, but particularly a passion around the arts and museums, because that's what I was doing at the Smithsonian Institution for the past 25 years. It certainly has a perspective that is grounded in research that I'm familiar with, that comes out of uh, the United States and um, Western Europe. So I'm going to share that with you. And we'll see how that fits. It's exciting to actually be able to share a passion with people that you know care a lot about similar things, and that's young children and the museum. So our topic tonight is making museums relevant for our children, a focus on early learning. But what does that really mean? What does early learning mean? Um, 
It depends who you ask. In the United States, there are several organizations that define early learning. For example, the US Department of Education defines early learning as birth through kindergarten, which is about five or six years of age. Other well-known organizations, like the National Association for the Education of Young Children, defines early learning as birth through age eight. In any case, my focus will really be in a narrower group, preschool, more or less, three through six, preschool and kindergarten. So if that's early learning, how do we find relevance for this age group in museums? The way that I describe relevance for young learners is really at that place of intersection between the child's world and the museum collection. In that intersection, it's that sweet spot where you can make those connections that are meaningful to the child based on his or her prior knowledge, but also connected in a meaningful way to the collection of the museum. And that's what we want to talk about. How do you make that happen? Every time you make one of those connections with a child, his world, his prior knowledge expands so that the next opportunity to come to the museum and to explore, that place of intersection is larger. And so that's what we want to do. So as we look at museums and young children, we need to look back and think about the place of children in museums. Museums have always been known as educational institutions once they became, took on a public uh, persona. We all know, for example, that prior to the public museum, uh, there were actually collections of curiosities in the homes of the elite and the higher status um, of society where they collected objects, these wonderful artifacts, these curiosities from their travels, and they displayed them in their homes for people of their social status. But that was prior to becoming the public museum. With the entry into the public museum world, education took, took a part of the mission, and that's really what it was. it was. So it's always been a part of the mission. But even in those early museums, many of those institutions were really thought to be for scholars and the elite for a certain social status. Um, in the United States in the early 20th century, um, America broadened its perspective when it comes to learning and to who the museum belongs to. So for example, um, it broadened the population of the audience they wanted to serve to be a more socially diverse group, to not only be for the upper class, but to be for all families. And they did that in a way to really educate them. They saw it as an opportunity to educate many times immigrants coming into America and others who did not have the same background as other people. So that's really the beginnings of, um, you know, young ch of museums. But at that point in time, young children, the way we're defining them, were not a part of that conversation. Today's museum defines audience differently. They define them as the young and old, the rich and poor, the local and global. And in that description, you can find young children because it taps into the young. It opens the door. So in the United States, how do we arrive at this point? Um, and when did that transition begin? I really think of three particular efforts going on in the United States in the 1990s that opened the door really for early learning in museums. The first was a real interest in early childhood education. And there was research being done to understand what high quality meant in terms of learning experiences for the young. You know, what were we going to do and why, why did it work? So it was all about research in the behaviors and activities and experiences of children. The second effort was also in early 1990s and that was brain research. So not looking at the observational behaviors of 
uh, the observed behaviors of children, but more looking at the actual physiology of the brain. What was happening, you know, in, in the physical structure of the brain during learning? And what the researchers found was what many educators had known intuitively for decades, and that is that the early years are significant in the learning process. Those first three to five years are absolutely the most important for learning. They found out that when children were engaged in rich experiences, whether they were visually rich experiences or other sensory-based experiences, that the actual architecture or physiology of the brain changed. It created new neural synapses or connections that became permanent over time. So for children, so it impacted learning for the rest of that child's life. It didn't mean that children who did not have those multisensory experiences could not ever create those synapses, but it was much more difficult to do at a later time. So it was really a focus on leveraging the opportunity of those early years and, and building the kinds of experiences into a young child's life, those great visual experiences and opportunities that we have in museums um, to advance opportunities for learning. So the third effort during that same time in the 1990s was a publication created by the American Association of Museums. It was called Excellence in Equity. And a group of leaders in museums decided that although education was perceived as part of the mission of most museums, it needed to have a higher priority. And they wanted it not only to be privileged more in the institution of museums, but they also wanted it to, the museum to see more diverse audiences as their target. So it wasn't only about a certain audience, it was about a more global audience, um, you know, different cultures, ethnicities, different ages, even different abilities. Those three efforts really opened the door for young children in museums in terms of creating these, you know, being advocates and creating these initiatives. And you see here an image of, this, of the Smithsonian's castle in Washington, D.C., where I was, um, fortunate to have been asked to found the lab school there. And three of my preschoolers at that time, you know, and, and this to me symbolizes the children and the opportunities that they had in an institution like that. And the Smithsonian has a long history, even with younger children, in much the way that we've heard about Kuwait. So at the time, you know, the, so museums have been changing institutions. And part of that change has been in redefining the role of the object in museums. Um, what we're finding in the United States and certainly in Western Europe as well and in other countries um, is that when you think about the object and the role of the object in the museum, there's this perception that the object, the story of that object really holds a certain set of truths. We certainly know when an object, often, not always, but we certainly can find out many times the time the object was created, who created it, who owned it, what kind of materials it's made of. There are a lot of facts that we, aren't, that we don't you know, debate. You know, those truths are evident. But in terms of actual knowledge being gleaned from the artifact, um, you know, it was believed that everybody saw that object in exactly the same way. Today, there's a shift, a paradigm shift, about how museums are viewing objects. They're no longer suggesting that each individual sees an object and creates meaning about an object in exactly the same way. That it's really constructed individually and uniquely based on a person's interests and prior knowledge and past experiences and even culture. The two objects that I have here, the top one, you might look at and I could ask you to think about or write down what you th see, how you would relate to it. And even if I gave you the background information about who it belonged to and the year it was from and whatever, still we would probably have in this room many, many different perceptions or interpretations of the object. Some would see this simply as an old, worn top hat, maybe from another time and era. 
I look at that and immediately I see Abraham Lincoln's hat because it is so iconic in American culture. Beyond that hat of Abraham Lincoln, I actually see the struggles our country went through and the emotions tied to it. And depending on whether you were from the North or from the South, you may have seen his actions as something valiant and courageous, um, or you may have seen them as you know, um, standing in the way of what they felt should be. You might compare it to the humble beginnings that as president, you know, his, his life was very different and of a different status than his humble beginnings. So I would look at that and I would create meaning based on a whole variety of understandings and personal connections that I have. Similarly, the little green creature here. How many, raise your hand if you recognize this little green guy. Okay, so at least half of you. Some of you might look at him and say, it's a little green frog, it's a puppet. I'm gonna look at that and I am so emotionally attached to Kermit because he was one of the first Muppets in Sesame Street. And in the early 70s, mid 70s, um, my oldest son was young, he was a preschooler, and so Kermit was invited into my home on many of occasion as we watched Sesame Street on TV. And so he became a part of our lives, a part of my child's life, a part of my life, and a part of my other children's lives. So my connection, the meaning I make from him, and the experiences that I remember are going to be uniquely uh, connected to me and very different than what someone else might have. But this is one of the major changes in museums. And if you think about it, it really opens an opportunity for children because no longer is the truth of the object solely about those characteristics or the numbers or the dates or the whatever, but it's about how you make a personal connection to it, how you interpret it. We all know that museums are trusted places of learning. They're places where we collect and study, preserve, exhibit, and interpret objects. And as institutions, they serve many different groups, from scholars to families to communities. But how do we move, you know, move from this trusted institution to a place of learning for young children? And I suggest that you have to begin with understanding educational theory. Um, George Hine, who is a remarkable educational theorist in the United States and a, and a, you know, a writer that many of us in the museum field um, you know, respect, suggests that there are three components of every educational theory. A theory of knowledge or study of epistemology, kind of the what you believe knowledge is and where it resides, from realism to idealism, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The second component is a theory of learning. How do people take in that information and acquire it? What is that process? Um, and again, a continuum to think about. What are your beliefs of each of those? And once you establish and consider what your beliefs or values are about theories of knowledge and theories of learning, that leads to an understanding of a theory of teaching. Okay, so we're gonna look at that a little bit more through the model that was constructed by George Hine. In this model, on the vertical axis, you see theories of knowledge. And at the top, what he considers to be realism is knowledge existing outside the learner, that it's the same for everyone regardless of any factors. Everyone, you know, the story, the knowledge is the same. It exists regardless of all of us. To the, low, to the bottom, where knowledge is constructed by the learner, personally or socially, and it really is unique to the individual. Each of us, based on our personal experiences, our prior knowledge, our culture, our language, all of our values is internal. And then you see theories of learning on the horizontal axis. From passive, which is on the incremental, added bit by bit, kind of that philosophy or theory of an individual as an empty vessel that someone with greater knowledge is gonna pour that information into. It's a transmission absorption model. 
to the opposite end of that continuum where it's active, where the individual is actively constructing or creating understanding or knowledge. And it is being done by restructuring those constructs in the brain. When you look at the intersection, you can describe four, four different approaches uh, to teaching or pedagogy. Um, in the top quadrant on the left, you see the didactic expository, and that's a lecture-based approach where knowledge really is the same for everyone and that the learner is passive. I'm kind of sharing information and giving it to you and you're taking it in. To the top right, which is discovery, where that knowledge is still exists um, the same for everyone, but I want you to find it actively, but I still want you to get to that same place of what exists in terms of knowledge. The lower left hand is stimulus response. And again, it's a passive learner, but it is that the individual is constructing knowledge individually. It isn't about finding a particular answer. It's about a process that the individual goes through. And the quadrant on the right bottom is constructivism, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time tonight. Constructivism really believes that learning is active, uh, that the learner is active, and constructing knowledge uniquely internally and that that knowledge is not going to ever be the same for everyone. And this is the basis, and George Hines says that based on all the theory and research that he believes constructivism is the approach that best suits the way people learn, what we know about learning. So we're going to spend a little time on this concept of constructivism. Jerome Bruder, one of the theorists um, of, of this past century, has a quote that I think sums up what constructivist learning is. He says, to instruct someone is not a matter of getting him to commit results to mind. Rather, it is to teach him to participate in the process that makes possible establishment of knowledge. We teach a subject not to produce little li living libraries on that subject. Rather, to get a student to think mathematically for himself, to consider, as an historian does, to take part in the process of knowledge getting. Knowledge is a process, not a product. And that truly defines the constructivist movement. Within that constructivist quadrant, um, this is a model that I created that focuses entirely on young learners, these you know, six-year-olds and younger, with knowledge at the center, because learning is really about this construction of knowledge. And because children are naturally creative, they explore. And through their explore, explorations of their environment, they experience and they take in information through their senses. As they do this, they create mental constructs or what uh, Piaget called schema, and these concepts, mental concepts in their mind. And so the process they go through, Piaget said, calls it assimilation and accommodation as you take in new experiences, the very first one creates that mental icon or concept in your mind. The next time you have a similar experience with that same topic, you take that information in or you assimilate it, you compare it to what you know, and if it's all the same, everything's fine. But if there's a disconnect in some way, which he calls disequilibration, what you need to do is you have to modify what you think and what you know to reflect this new information, how these two can live hand in hand. So this is, that's accommodating. So he calls it assimilation and accommodation. And it is that, conce that concept development that comes out of experience and bringing it in. Once individuals, children, have concepts, this conceptualization, they can go beyond that to imagine, going beyond, comparing, what if, and they manipulate them mentally. From imagining, we create, and creating is an active process, and it could be create through play, through language, through storytelling, through other bodily actions, but through art making, but that's what children do. This is a model that's dynamic and never-ending. 
it is not linear in the way that it might look to you because a child might be doing one aspect and then moving to another across the way. But these are all parts of the process of early learning and how children construct knowledge. So how did they decide? What, what is some of the research that Hein talked about and why he believes that constructivist learning, this active learning, is so important? This research was done by Dale in 1946, and there have been many other um, replications of it since. But if we start at the top, what it says is that from the data they've collected is that when you're listening to a lecture, maybe like I'm giving now, the possibility is that the average retention rate is like 5%. So when you go home, you're going to remember maybe 5% of what I say, give or take your interest, your prior knowledge, all of that. If you read the exact same thing, you're likely to remember 10% on average. Audiovisual, and maybe I'm not the lecture straight, but I've included images, so therefore, we've moved to the audiovisual, and so it's the 20% is the average of what you might retain. If I were to do a demonstration, a demonstration tonight, and I might, it would increase your likelihood of knowing and remembering to 30%. If we have an open discussion and you take part in it, it's 50%. And if you actually are doing something actively engaged in this whole process, the likelihood that you will remember and retain the information in a meaningful way increases to 75%. And then, of course, there's teaching others. And that's the highest rate of all. But research like this and others really supports the um, beliefs of Hein and other museum educators. So to kind of wrap this up about the changing ideas in theory, we can look at kind of the traditional or how things have often been done. With learning being considered passive, knowledge existing outside of the learner and acquired bit by bit through transmission absorption. The teaching model as didactic or expository, that lecture that recognizes the information is being transmitted by a more knowledgeable individual. To a more current or contemporary perspective, which I'm going to call progressive, that may or may not be the terminology that we, we use, but um, many of our writers like John Dewey really initiated this um, in a, what was considered the progressive era, era um, went out of favor um, in the middle of the 20th century and came back into favor. So we're call, we often call it progressive. And we see it as learning being active active on the part of the learner, that knowledge is constructed within the learner through interaction with the environment, and that includes with people, and that the social model values exploration and discovery where the learner is at the center of the process. But this certainly isn't the only approach in terms of uh, research being done. Uh, the work of John Falk and Lynn Deerking in learning from museums is another example, and real quickly, they just talk about the complex nature of learning, where all learning is influenced by the personal context, the socio-cultural context, and the physical context. And that's what they're describing in this model, and that they say that it occurs over time. That <clears throat> in the museum, you all three of these influences come together. But you may not have a full understanding or construct meaning fully until it applies in later life. Six months from now, you do something, and all of a sudden, that exhibit you saw at the muni museum takes on new meaning. And, and so that's what they're saying. But again, this is also constructivist. All of this fits in to that constructivist model, because it's really saying that learning is unique to the individual. So here's that paradigm shift from the object-centered to the visitor-centered, where it is the visitor Inter, uh, the, the, the learning is taking place, meaning is constructed at that intersection between the visitor and the object. An example of that might be a beautiful necklace or bracelet like this from Desert Jewels, which is a, a part of a collection um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, this piece of jewelry is made from coral and stone, silver, plastic coins, and woven rope both high and low materials combined. Now, how you see this or how, what the meaning that it holds for you will be different for each person. 
if, if I happen to have roots or traditions in an African background, African culture or ethnicity, I may see my family, I may see colors that are prominent in, in so much of our culture and, and, and even materials, and I may have a real clear connection to that. Someone else maybe sees it through an aesthetic lens, an artist perhaps, and sees the beauty of it as an aesthetic piece. Someone else, a historian or a scientist, are looking at it in yet a different way. Each of us looks at, interacts with mentally, and constructs meaning based on a whole lot of other factors, other than just simply what it is and where it's from and who it belonged to. So what do these new paradigms have to do with young children in museums and where are the opportunities? This happens to be a, a, a picture of some of the children who are in my lab school at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. And here you see them actively engaged with this sculpture by Barry Flanagan. It's called The Drummer. And the children had to think about this rabbit or hare, as he actually was, uh, what he was doing, and is he real or pretend? You know, could real rabbits do this? And how could we model his actions? They decided he was leading a parade and that they needed to join the parade with him. So, but what do museum professionals need to know to meet the needs of young learners? What do we need to know to be able to figure out that this is the way to engage them? Well, I think there are a variety of ways to know. First of all, we go back to the research that tells us how important the early years are as a significant time of learning. And we think about how do we know about this audience? Every one of you in here knows children and has impressions of children and how they interact with their world because of your observations, your personal observations, and whether it's of your own children, um, children at school, you know, uh, nieces and nephews, Children in the grocery store at the park, you already have a sense of how children learn. You add to that an understanding through educational theory and what you have is a fuller understanding to really get at ch young learners. So when you add that together, um, this chart helps us think about how children learn. They are active in their learning. Um, we see children not sitting passively by, although there are those who observe, pass, and that's fine, because every child is unique, but clearly children are active learners, and they are from that, the earliest time of their lives. As soon as they're mobile, they're often picking up things and getting things, but even a child laying in a crib is moving and shaking and, you know, kicking at things. They're active learners. They're sensory learners. They're touching, they're tasting, they're smelling, they're using their bodies, their kinesthetic sense. They are sensory-based learning uh, learners, and they're taking it in to construct that meaning. They're naturally curious. They really want to know. You know, they want to know, and they're the first to explore and try to find out. They're social. Now, here's where some of the children in their social interaction might be observers. They might be watching, ready to imitate, ready to, um, you know, see you as a model and take on what you, you know, that, those, those ideas through their social interaction. They are playful. They engage with others socially in play. They make meaning in play. And each one of our theorists talks about all of these, um, you know, experiences. And the one about play is really significant. Because so often people say that children learn through play, but they really don't understand what does that mean. It's not just a randomness of, you know, frivolous action. They're constructing meaning and acting out the role of their world through their play. They're trying to figure out the nuances. They're trying to see if what they know and what they understand meets with reality. Children are also classifiers. They're constantly looking for similarities and differences. They're ordering things. Uh, and they do this even without our, um, you know, instructing, although we can encourage them to do it more. But they do it. They intuitively see how something, one th object is the same as another, and they put it together like pieces of a puzzle. 
And children are also intuitive storytellers. They, research tells us that they make sense out of their world and they understand their world through story and narrative. And those are probably the highlights of young children as learners. And certainly there are many more aspects we could talk about, but that kind of captures the big picture. So if we want to support young children in museums, we have to think about how museum educators or anyone working in a museum, a, a, a museum guide, um, you know, or, or anyone interested in designing exhibition space for young children, how they can create authentic learning experiences for children in a gallery environment. This happens to be an example at the Botanic Gardens in Washington and a group of four-year-olds. The children had been in the, you know, uh, it, it had a, an experience with the actual flowers and the scents of the flowers and then they came into this, um, ex this sensory exhibition space that was created just for them so that they could compare some of their experiences from the plants that they had experienced out in the um, main part of the Botanic Gardens um, to some of the experiences here. So how do we support young children? Well, John Dewey, and again, probably America's uh, most well-known um, educational philosopher, he suggested that learning really begins with a child's interest. He said, only through the continual and sympathetic observation of childhood interests can the adult enter a child's life and see what it is ready for and upon what material it could work most readily and fruitfully. So he's really defining or describing the child's world of that first graphic. Um, Jerome Bruner similarly advised that learning is best achieved by nurturing natural curiosity, discovery, providing interesting materials, and creating opportunities for exploration that are age appropriate. He also focused in on understanding and knowing children's interests. So we've talked a lot about theory. Why? Because theory matters. Theory guides our practice. It provides answers to why we do what we do. It helps us understand when something doesn't go quite the way we expect it. Why might that be? If I go back and look at theory, what have I missed? What might I do to change um, my practice to align better with the theory? Theory is clearly the foundation for building strong, effective, age-appropriate programs and experiences. And I have to say, this particular image is of a young child who's um, here in the children's art workshop. And when I was here last year, we were at Lucy's gallery across the way. And the children were drawing. They were actively engaged with the art through drawing after they had talked about it. And here she is sketching the art that she sees. Um, and I'm really extra proud of that because it happens to be on the cover of my book. But it warms my heart because it's a child and an experience from here, which I loved. So how do we get from theory to practice? This is the part everybody wants to say, oh, forget all the rest of it. Why didn't you just start here? And I understand that. But given the fact that I teach at a university and I teach educational theory, I believe that it's really important. And when we ground our work, our practice in theory, we're more likely to meet the needs of the audience. All good teachers know that. So the, real, the theories that we're gonna go through real quickly are thematic-based experiences, inquiry-based learning, sensory exploration, play, and storytelling. And really quickly through these. Here you see an example at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles, California. It's a traditional museum with traditional cases and installations and exhibitions like you might have here. But they have an exhibition that I think they say is for everyone, but it is so draws in children. And it's Noah's Ark based on the biblical story. And he, within this exhibition, there's an opportunity for each one of these strategies to be implemented. But let's go one by one through them real quickly. So what is a thematic experience? A thematic experience for me is creating a program for children or designing some kind of experience that has all of the elements together, okay? And we always say as an educator that less is more. 
it's not about going in and seeing everything in the museum. It's about being very thoughtful, very, very purposeful about what you choose and why you choose it. And so we might have an in-depth exploration of three objects, or maybe as many as five. And here I selected birds and art. But traditional museums can, can really, um, you know, are, are so broad that you can choose almost any topic or theme. So in this thematic experience, we've chosen birds. And I might have the John James Audubon image of a bird. I have that beautiful plate with a peacock. And then I have a sculpture of a, of a, a wooden sculpture of a bird from uh, Chinese art. So this provides the opportunity for children to really explore in depth this concept of birds. How are they the same and how are they different? How were artists inspired by birds in the community? And what will happen is that as we go through these strategies, you'll find that you usually link several together. Probably not all five that I'm talking about, and there are others, but maybe two, sometimes three. And so there are strategies that you would use to engage children in thinking and talking about these artifacts or works of art. What's important is that children see their world almost as puzzle pieces, every experience has meaning in and of itself, and yet a child tries to relate it to other experiences. It's almost like putting together pieces of a puzzle. So if we choose three very random experiences that have no relationship to one another, we really are encouraging some kind of frustration on the part of a child because he or she is not going to find meaning as a whole. So it's really helping a child and, and, and leveraging how children learn in terms of making meaning. Another example, I did work uh, for three years as a consultant at the Bishop Museum in Hawaiian Hall um, in Oahu. And so one of the experiences or programs that we developed uh, was around containers and around dried gourds. And so we, we looked at all different kind of artifacts in the exhibition in Hawaiian Hall that were created with dried gourds, from containers to musical instruments, drinking vessels, jewelry, many different artifacts. We started the tour with a gourd from the garden that has not been dried yet. And children got to really have a sensory experience with that and to feel it and look at it. And then we had a dried gourd that was similar in shape and size. And they compared it. And they were just in awe of the fact of how much the, the market gourd, the gourd from the garden, weighed, how heavy it was compared to the other. But when we went into the galleries and we looked at artifacts created from gourds, the children had a much different understanding about where they came from and how they were created. So it was giving them that connection, but also creating this link between different artifacts within the gallery all coming from gourds. Here in your museum, you have the long ago zoo, Animals in the Al Sabah collection, and the exhibition up there that was curated by our six to 12 year olds here. Um, the Markor goat, which I put here as an animal from the Al Sabah collection, although it is in splendors, not in the long ago zoo, but it represents animals in the collection. Now, that exhibit was already designed around a, a theme, but it may be too much to do all of it with a group of young children. So you could you know, break it down into many themes and just choose one of them. You could talk about animals there that were real and compare them with some that were pretend. Or you could look at creatures that fly. Or you could talk about animal homes and how different animals lived in different types of homes and only choose a few. Or you could talk about animal coverings like feathers, fur, or scales. Many possibilities, but you do not need to do it all. Less is more. The second strategy is inquiry-based learning. And inquiry is really a process of discovery that begins with looking. And then you listen to, you ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions that don't have one right answer. What do you notice about the object? What do you find interesting? You know, what can you tell me about it? So it's looking, it's questioning, and then it's listening, listening to the responses of children. And from listening, you then validate their thinking, you make associations, and you extend the conversation 
with new questions. But you're really helping children draw on their personal experience to find meaning. Inquiry is very natural. And so there are different kinds of inquiry. A natural inquiry, like I just described, evolves. There are structured inquiry programs like thinking routines that are out of Harvard's Project Zero. One is called See, Think, Wonder. Another's What Makes You Say That. One of my favorite is I Used to Think, But Now I Think. Ask kids that. I, you, you know, what did you used to think? But now what do you think? It's about understanding the process of thinking. But it's really about engaging children by asking open-ended questions that encourage them to think about what they see. Here, an example of a thinking routine um, is around a small collection of teapots that was in one of the exhibits um, when I was in China recently in November. And so if you were using a see thick wonder routine, you would ask the children, well, what do you see? What do you think and what do you wonder? Well, what do you see? I see different kinds of teapots. They're different sizes, different shapes, different colors. They have handles. Well, what do you think? Well, I think they might have been very special because they look very different than the ones that I have at my house. Well, what do you wonder? I wonder what that other object is used for that wasn't there before, that isn't a teapot. I wonder what the artist was thinking about when he or she decided to create these teapots. I wonder what kind of materials they used. So this whole process of inquiry is really about looking, questioning, listening, responding, and extending. So you're now getting my sensory activity, and I didn't give it to you at the beginning because we might have played with it the whole way through. But once we've talked about inquiry, which is really, if you remember anything about inquiry, it's a questioning process that really develops into a conversation. You are having a conversation with children in the gallery. Okay, so we said that children learn through their senses. And so I want you to look closely at your feather. I want you to think about, as you touch that feather, what do you learn from that sensory experience? Just think about it. I want you to take 15 seconds and share one discovery you made with the person next to you. Just share one discovery, something that you thought, oh, I didn't think about this before, or, oh, this reminds me about what I thought. Real quickly, share, share a quick discovery. What did you think with someone next to you? Okay, so if I were sitting in front of this painting with a group of children, I might use this feather. I might have the children touch it and use their sensory, sensory senses to explore it, to try to make sense out of it. You know, how would this object encourage them to look differently at that painting? What would it do? What would they know? Remember that that child's world and their prior knowledge is limited. They have a certain set of experiences and they have a certain set of knowledge. Maybe they see cartoons of birds, but their idea of feather may not be as extensive as yours is as an adult. And yet, even when I've done this in a teaching setting with adults and we really explore my feathers, what they find is that they make discoveries about feathers that they had no idea about before. We all learn through our senses, but children primarily learn through their senses. We discover things each time we have a sensory encounter. So this simple feather can be an entry point into something we see. It can help us look. If we will go back and remember that plate with the peacock in the middle, um, when I was talking about the theme of birds, if I had you know, shown the children and let them touch and look at my peacock feather, they would have had a different understanding about why the artist chose the colors he chose, why the patterns looked the way they did, you know, why the lines might have looked the way they looked. But the object itself informs their thinking, that sensory experience. We use teaching objects to help children look. When they, we know they can't touch ob the artifacts, 
Here is a blown glass work of art by Dale Chihuly. And it's a shell. But on the left is a shell that is just a simple shell from a store and a teaching collection. But you can see why I chose that shell as part of the experience, because children can engage with it. Touching changes how they look. If you're you know, comparing containers, we have a woven basket, a drinking gourd, a, a gourd drinking vessel, a clay pot, each constructed differently or coming from a different source. But if you had fibers, natural fibers, if you had that dried gourd, if you had a piece of clay, what kind of rich experiences and conversations could you have that children would know and understand the objects in a different way? That's the sensory experience. And play, of course, play and discovery. More and more museums are recognizing the value of play, knowing that in play, children explore, experiment, test, imagine, solve problems, and they create. As Piaget, Piaget says, play is a child's work. We need to bring that more into museums. At the, at the um, Skirball Cultural Center, here you see a combination of two of these strategies of play and storytelling, which is the last strategy. On Noah's Ark, the children are imagining what it was like for the animals to be rolling with those deep waves in a big, big ark, back and forth, telling the story of Noah and imagining what it would be like to be on that ark. And the final strategy that we look at is really about narrative and storytelling. And again, we're back to a familiar figure, the Markor goat. The Markor goat in your collection is a wonderful artifact, but it may be one that children are less familiar with. So by reading a simple story like The Three Billy Goats Gruff, a tale about these little animals, the children are, become acquainted with characteristics of goats and are then able to compare the characteristics of the goats in the book with what they see in the artifact in the museum. How are they the same? How are they different? Which of the goats in the story is most like the Markor goat? It's in that intersection, that point of relevance. Sometimes the book is inspired by the artifact in the museum. Sometimes it's the book itself that inspires the program. So a book like Shape, Shape, Shapes by Hannah Tobin can be used when you're looking at shapes in galleries because shapes are all around us. And museum exhibits tell stories through objects. You know, here's the peddling life and how, instead of going to a store, you know, two centuries ago, rural Americans would purchase, um, you know, uh, utility types of tools that they needed for the kitchens um, from a peddler who came by, a butter churn, uh, you know, a masher, brooms, other things. So what we do, this combines two of the strategies of having a touching or a teaching object, an object like a masher that they could hold and touch and compare to what they see. And even bringing in a, today's version of a masher would help them understand. And bringing it all together, it's really about using strategies for children. With a very familiar piece like Degas, Little Dancer, this happens to be one of them at the National Gallery of Art, you can create a conversation with open-ended questions and allow the children to really respond to what they see. You can give them a ribbon or a piece of fabric from the, that's similar to what would be in the, that the sculptor used um, in the sculpture. You could have a toe shoe, a ballet shoe, with a hard toe that they could touch. Now remember, these are teaching art objects, not museum artifacts things that are permissible to touch that you bring with you in a basket to help them understand how dancers can stand on their toes. You could tell a story or read a story like Degas and the Little Dancer by Lawrence Ann Holt because it's historically accurate. You could encourage them to learn through play. You know, turn on some classical music as you're sitting there. Invite the children to become the dancer. Um, what we know is that children's memory is extended so much by their interaction. So what is the value of early learning in museums? It really is to broaden children's horizons and cultures, to build vocabulary, to really help them uh, develop what we call 21st century skills, 
um, of creativity and um, innovation of critical thinking and problem solving. Because what's important is that we make museum experiences relevant for young visitors, that we find that place of intersection. Because the children of today are the patrons of tomorrow. Thank you.